Okay, thank you for kind invitation. You will see at the end of my talk why I came here and what I would like to do. So uh, the title of my talk is Nuclear Ranclear, okay? And are any inositol phosphates doing something with the cell cycle? So if you've opened the textbook, I'm a physiologist. Uh, this is the Guyton, famous textbook. And if you look at the signaling, so it's very well known if you have hormone or peptide, uh, it can activate the key enzyme, the phospholipase C, and then it will produce IP3, which releases calcium from endoplasmic reticulum and the diacylglycerol, and then the protein kinase C gets activated. You get the protein phosphorylation, and then you get the cell response. So this is a very simple book because the guide on a simple book. If you, for example, look at the other book, which is more, more com much more complex, like a Bulup, then uh, you will notice that this lipid signaling story becomes more complicated if you look at uh, example of the insulin that you will get that this insulin response substances will then activate one of those three kinases then there will be some kind of phosphorylation of inositol lipids and then you have the AKT which will then produce effects of the, of the insulin in the cell. So, it's rather simple when you are on the gradient and you are studying the, the simple physiology, but then if you try to do the science and see, okay, what's going on in a real cell, so then it's become much more complicated because you have those inositol lipids. This is the major pathway which gets phosphorylated. Here you have this, the, the phospholipase C. Then you have the so-called three kinases which will add three phosphates to this inositol ring. And you have different isomers, but remember that there are two different major signaling pathways. This is the phospholipase C pathway, the other is so-called three kinase pathway. Uh, most of those inositol lipids are, or do possess some signaling functions. This will be produced when the cell is under stress. And this part will be produced when cell, for example, go to endocytosis. Those signaling molecules have something to do with the endocytosis. Uh, besides inositol lipids, you have the phosphates. Now it becomes even more complicated. If you try to kill undergraduate student of biochemistry, you will ask him or her to do this very simple trick, try to write down different molecules. So what is going on? Uh, here you have the phosphorylation, so the inositol phosphate, this is the IP3, will get phosphorylated, this is the IP6, this is known as the phytic acid, and this is the growth uh, uh, hormone or growth factor for the plants. So in mammalian cell it's rather complicated, but in budding yeast you have a little bit less of the enzyme. Uh, the principal question is, okay, why the cell produces uh, inositol phosphates. If you, for example, measure or calculate the amount, you will notice this is the molecule which releases IP3. This is very low concentration in the, in the cell. And if you are phosphorylating this, you will actually increase the amount of the concentration of the molecule. If you compare the concentration of IP6 to IP3, it has about 1,000 fold increase in concentration. So the simple question is, what is going on, why the cells do actually uh, phosphorylate inositol phosphates and what is the function of inositol phosphates. So uh, for trying to describe what I was doing in the last 30 or more years, uh, I will need some uh, help from some friends which, whom I was working for a long time period. Okay, so uh, I will point some of them. So this is the key issue, this is Robin Irwin. He is the guy who is actually Nobel Committee. Uh, he discovered the IP3 signaling and he's my old friend when he was actually a postdoc in Rex Dawson Love and it was 30 or more years ago. The other guy here is Nal Device and this is me and Nal and myself did initial experiments on nuclear lipid signaling. Uh, this is John York, so I hook up with John uh, who is actually at, now at the Vanderbilt a uh, couple of years ago. And this is your fellow Italian, this is Lucio Cocco and actually all the story about an ositol lipid signaling in the cell nuclei was actually initiated by this guy. He's a very nice guy, although he stopped smoking and he's still uh, in pain because the, you know, the Italian government uh, forced, I don't know, a couple of years ago, to st 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 yeah, several years ago, and he was a heavy smoker and he said he is not drinking coffee anymore because he is not allowed to smoke in his department. Okay, and how the story starts? Uh, it starts here in Babraham. 
Uh, this is famous Victorian building. Actually, the laboratory is not here. It's located, it's a rusty building or cabin just uh, uh, on the side. Uh, if you look, for example, uh, if you watch the film uh, King's Speech, this was the famous building which was shot when the King George V was dying. Okay, and the story started that in late 80s, I was coming uh, over there in, and working in a Robin laboratory and trying to figure out how the kidney grows. So, very simple, if you remove one kidney, the second kidney enlarges. Okay, I was interesting, and for these purposes, I developed a lipid assay. One day, Lucio Coco came and said in his English, Ervoye, would you be so kind to perform some lipid kinase assays for me? And I said, yes, I would, should be in any problem. And in those days, uh, there was a beginning of molecular biology. And they got some hybridoma cells, which were producing the um, insulin growth grow factor. And I did some tests, and the results, as usual in science, were rather inconclusive. Okay. Uh, and then we decided to do, uh, let's say, nuclei signaling and trying to do what is going on. So when you isolate the uh, nuclei from the cell, uh, the nuclei possess so-called inner membrane and outer membrane. So you have to use the deter detergents to get rid of outer nuclear membrane. And then you have only inner nuclear membrane and uh, chromatin and the nuclear lamina. If we hit the cells and we did this, we did some measurements. So if you are not knowing what is going on, very simply put it in one large table. So nobody would realize what is important from this table. But what is important from this table is that if you do just very simple calculation, how much radioactivity you got, you got a huge amount of radioactivity in the cell extracts and very small amount of radioactivity in the nuclei. Um, we said, okay, something was going on when we hit the cells with IGF, and we decided to do more, uh, let's say, uh, complex or, let's say, more detailed study. And for this, Nal and I did, in, it was in 1989 and 1990, we developed mass assays for the inositol lipids and phosphates, and we measured this in the nuclei, and when we were clearly what was uh, shown or what we did here is that if you hit the cells with IGF-1, it will increase the acylglycerol, the PIP-2 will fall down, which will be actually the consequence of phospholipid-C activation, and uh, the protein kinase it translocates to the nuclei. So what is happening on the cell membrane? If you hit the cells with IGF, nothing is happening. If you hit the cell with the IGF and bombazine, then the bombazine makes the same response, which means it increases the acylglycerol and translocate protein kinase into the uh, cell membrane. Okay. Uh, when I then went back home in Croatia, I remember my renal compensatory growth model, and I tried to figure out whether in vivo is also, I can notice the same effect. And what I did, I did very simple, um, let's say, uh, experiment. I did either partial hepatectomy or nephrectomy. What is the difference? If you remove one kidney, the, the other one will enlarge, but the cells will not divide. In the liver, when you take out two-thirds of the liver, what is left will enlarge and the cell will divide. So what was the difference? If you do the nephrectomy, nothing is happening, okay? You isolate the nuclei, can you notice any signal? The answer is no. If you, for example, do the same um, uh, thing with a partial hepatectomy, what is going to happen? You will increase, you have increase in nuclear diacylglycerol, and then you will have translocation of protein kinase into the nuclei. Okay. Which model was this? That was a rat. Okay. okay. Uh, the good thing about this model is you can get a lot of nuclei. Okay. And then uh, I decided, or we decided then in Zagreb to do a simple biochemistry to see uh, if measure the activity of the enzyme, when you will get increase in the activity. What is interesting, you can notice only the increase in activity in the nuclei, not in, for example, cytosolic fraction. Of uh, homogenate or so. And we noticed two peaks, one which was about six hours following the partial hepatectomy and the other one which was 24 hours. If we compare what is going during this time period in the cell, uh, about six hours you will have the phosphorylation of MAP and about 24 hours you will have increase in time and incorporation which means the cell will go into the cell cycle probably the S phase. Okay, uh, we decided to look more in detail which 
isoform of the phospholipase C. You can isolate if you take the whole nuclei which are cleaved from our nuclear membrane. You can get three, three different isoforms. So usually you don't know much about the uh, phospholipase C, but there are 10 or 12 different isoforms in the human cell or mammalian cells, but you can only notice three of them from the from the from the nuclei of the liver, which is uh, going uh, partial hepatectomy. Uh, what can you do with those nuclei? You can very simply do a simple experiment to, uh, let's say, uh, remove out a nuclear membrane from chromatin. So if you have so-called uh, just, uh, let's say, um, nuclear lamina, so you from three you can get two of them. This is the two of them, this is the PL, PLC gamma, and if you notice the amount of the enzyme will stay the same 6 and 20 hours following partial hepatectomy, but what is going on here, so you will have increase in tyrosine phosphorylation, which means that the enzyme gets tyrosine phosphorylated, and that's why you get its uh, activation. On the other hand, if you looked on the other phospholipase C, this is called 1-beta, you have two different isoforms, 1A and 1B. What is the difference? 1A will stay in the uh, cytosol and 1B will stay in the nuclei. Why? Because this 1B lacks nuclei uh, export signal. So what is going to happen? Uh, six hours, okay, the amount of the enzyme is the same, but after 20 hours you will have increase in the amount of the protein. And uh, if you look at how this is, uh, activity increases in six hours, you will get increased phosphorylation on uh, phosphoserine residues. So which means there are different isoforms of the phospholipase C in the nuclei. Uh, those two are localized where on the nuclei lamina. But if you look at the chromatin, you can isolate the chromatin from the cell. The, the PLC delta actually is localized there. So what is happening? Six hours, nothing is happening, and about 20 hours you will have increase in the amount of protein. So uh, we can conclude from those experiments that there are different isoforms of phospholipase C which are localized in the nuclei. They have different uh, types of um, uh, activation. Uh, the problem with this kind of model was that uh, you cannot synchronize the cell and the problem is that only very small proportion of the cell will actually go through the cell cycle. So we were a little more interested in, in uh, showing, okay, what is going on with the phospholipase C during the cell cycle. Uh, we use the HL60 cells, the human leukemia cells, for these purposes. So you can do the synchronization in a couple of different manner. One is to uh, just add a nocodazole, block the cell cycle progression, and then release the cell, and the cells will go through the cell cycle. So then what is going to happen with the activity of the enzyme? Uh, you will have two peaks, one about 60 minutes, which is just at the G2M uh, phase uh, boundary, and then you will have the increase in about, let's say, eight to nine hours, which is late S phase. Okay, so which means that the protein or the, uh, the enzyme gets activated following the release from the nocodazole block. Uh, if you look at more detail uh, which isoform is involved, you can do the immunoprecipitation and you can nicely immunoprecipitate the enzyme with the anti-beta-1 antibody, which means not the gamma-1, which means that you have increase in the activity of the phospholipase C beta 1. Uh, if you look at, or if you look in more detail, as I told you, there are two different isoforms, one which is uh, 1A, which is localized in the cytosol, what is happening? Nothing. One what is, uh, which is localized, which is 1B, okay, if you look the amount here in the cytosol is very low. Uh, if you look at the nuclei, what you will see, you will notice no difference. So, you can conclude from this, the amount of the enzyme will not change. Okay, but what will change? Uh, uh, it will change the amount of phosphorylation. So, for example, the amount of phosphorylation of the enzyme in the cytosol will stay the same, but if you look at the amount of uh, phosphorylated enzyme in the nuclei, it will increase if you use the phosphoserine antibody, which means, okay, fine, uh, uh, what is going on, the enzyme gets activated by uh, phosphoserine uh, phosphorylation. Uh, you can play with uh, signaling pathway how to use the MEK inhibitor. We know, or we did some other experiments, that 
uh, this kind of activation of phospholipase C is due the, to the MEK kinase uh, activation. If you look, for example, if you use the inhibitor, you can block this phosphorylation, which means that the phospholipase C is downstream of the, of the uh, MEK or MAP kinase. Um, now, uh, you can measure the activity and notice if you, for example, use the, either the, the phospholipase C inhibitor or you use the MAC inhibitor, you will actually inhibit the enzyme activity. If you're using some other inhibitors which are not specific for this signaling pathway, what is going to happen? Nothing is happening. Okay, fine, which is uh, the same proof with another manner what is going on here. Uh, the simple question is, uh, what is going on if, for example, if you use or inhibit the enzyme activity with the cell cycle? Uh, very simply, if we do this, so what is going to happen? This is the progression through the cell cycle. If you use the inhibitor, the progression of cell cycle will be delayed. So uh, remember that, for example, if you don't have the phospholipase C, what is going to happen? You are flying over the Atlantic with um, for example, with a plane with four engines, if you shut down one engine, still you have three engines, so the cells will fly, which means they will go through the cell cycle, but it will be a little bit delayed. Uh, the other thing, or the same experiments, what can be done in, in, in the other manner is, for example, you can block the cell cycle progression if you just um, starve the cell. So if you starve the cell, omit the fetal uh, FBS, so what is going to happen? Okay, the cells will stop in a cell cycle, and then if you release them, so what is going to happen? Once again, you will see increase in the peaks of the phospholipase C. Those peaks can be once again blocked by specific inhibitors, and this peak corresponds for, to, for example, to early G1 phase, and this one corresponds to the late G1 phase. If you look, for example, what is going to happen, what is happening once again, so the enzyme gets activated but phosphoserine phosphorylation. Uh, if you look at the cell cycle progression, if you actually do the same experiment, if you block uh, the cell cycle progression by different uh, inhibitors, what is going to happen, the cell cycle will be delayed. So from all those experiments, what can be concluded? Uh, uh, the enzyme gets activated by uh, um, MAP kinase. Uh, the principal enzyme is uh, beta-1b, which is known to be localized in the nuclei. It gets activated in, let's say, three points during the cell cycle in early G1, late G1, and G2M phase. And what is the consequence of this? Uh, the consequence of phospholipase C activation will be that it will produce diacylglycerol, and due to this, the protein kinase, this has been done namely by some other groups, namely those Italian groups, uh, will uh, do the, some kind of phosphorylation, for example, of uh, uh, lamin uh, A and lamin B. Also, what is going to be the, the protein kinase will phosphorylate some transcriptional factors. Uh, what I was then interested in was, okay, uh, if the phospholipase C is in the nuclei, and if the phospholipase C gets activated, so what is going to happen with this IP3, which is known to be the signaling molecule in the cytosol? Uh, remember that cell do not, the cell nuclei does not uh, release the, the calcium from IP3 because there are no receptors. And what about phosphorylation to the higher inositol phosphates? This is rather tricky to perform in the nuclei from mammalian cell. Why? Because if, for example, if you remove the nuclear membrane, what is going to happen, you will, because these compounds are soluble in, a, in, a, in a water, so you will get lost of them. Um, that's why we decided to shift to the yeasts. Why shift to the yeast? We were doing first for a long time period the story on mammalian cells, so why we decided to shift to the yeast? Very simply, if you look at the metabolism, uh, the metabolism in uh, yeast is much more simple. This is the simple phosphorylation. You have only one phospholipase C. If you're going through three kinase pathway, you only have one so-called VPS34. And if you look, for example, is there any connection between yeast and uh, uh, high eukaryotes uh, nuclei? The answer is very, very simple and it's very, very positive. 
if you look in the simple data, what can you find in the nuclear? You can find those components of the yeast. So we believe that during the process of evolution, the simple signaling was developed in the yeasts. Okay? And then in the process of, of evolution, those simple inositolipid signaling became nuclear signaling and on the cell membrane, the mammalian cells or more complex cells uh, decided to, let's say, evolutionary develop more complex you know, inositolipid signaling. So it's very simple. The yeast signaling is very similar to nuclear signaling. And then by, uh, let's say, studying the yeast signaling, you are actually indirectly studying the nuclear signaling. So in the last couple of years, I decided to shift to the uh, yeast and uh, yeast inositol metabolism. Once again, trying to figure out, okay, what inositol phosphates are doing in the yeast? And the simple question is, is has this anything to do with the cell cycle? Uh, why this was very important? Because we know that in yeast, if you, for example, uh, this is the simple uh, scheme how uh, in yeast uh, inositol 3 phosphate gets phosphorylated, there are three different enzymes, but if you omit one of this enzyme, you, the yeast model or yeast cells will have a huge problem. If you delete IPK2, you will have problem with gene expression, chromatin remodeling. If you remove IPK1, you have the problem with the RNA editing, messenger RNA export. And if you, if you remove the KCS, this is the another enzyme, you will have the problem with the telomere length and DNA uh, repair. So it's known that, uh, that the enzymes which are involved in uh, phosphorylation of inositol 3 phosphates to higher inositol phosphates uh, will actually produce a huge problem for the cells. So I decided, or we decided to do some experiments, and we were also interested in, in, in cell cycles. So in yeast, you can control cell cycle by a couple of different manners. And one of the issues is to uh, add the alpha factor. Alpha factor is actually a mating factor. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. You have two I on alpha, and so when they will try to have sex, so they are secreting different factors, and the factors when they are in, so they have sex and they then they go for sleep. Okay, but if you have only one or a, so if you add the alpha factor, what is going to happen? These are normally uh, unsynchronized cells. If you add the alpha factor, what is going to happen? You will have this type of schmooing, which means it will wait until you remove the alpha factor and then it will go through the cell cycle. So normally in yeast you have this logarithmic phase, so most of the cells are in the G2M phase. If you add the factor for a couple of hours, you will, most of the cells you will have a G1 phase and then you will, by simply releasing the cell into the fresh media, you will go through the cell cycle. And that's why I decided to uh, do a little bit of biochemistry, as in my nature I'm lipid biochemist. So uh, I did very simple uh, measurement. I add radioactive inositol and look what is going on. So if you, for example, look at incorporation rate, which means you are looking at metabo metabolic turnover. So what is going to happen if you release the cell from the alpha block, what is going to happen? You will have increase in the PIP2 and you will have increase uh, in IP6. Why in those two compounds? Because they are most abundant in the, in the, in the yeast. So um, from this experiment, very simply, I could notice that, okay, something is going on. Let's see in a more detail what is going on in those cells. If uh, we pre-label the cell to isotopic equilibria, which means uh, the uh, inositol incorporates in all inositol phosphates, and then release the cells from the alpha factor block. So what can you notice? So this is the HPLC profile. So uh, you can notice the increase in IP3 radioactivity, which means concentration, the uh, amount of radioactivity in IP4 and IP5 stays the same. Uh, there will be increase in IP7 and IP8. Remember those uh, phosphates, because you have the inositol ring has a so-called pyrophosphates. They have two phosphates on one uh, C uh, molecule, and you have the IP6. So uh, let's see what is going on in the system. Uh, very simply, if you look to the time course, you will notice the increase in IP3. You will notice the increase in PIP2, which is actually precursor of this. If you measure the activity, you will increase 
uh, notice the increase in the phospholipase C activity, which means following the release of alpha, alpha factor, the phospholipase C <coughs> gets activated. Uh, the beauty of the yeast system here is that you can use the inhibitors, but you ha also have the mutants and see what is going on. For example, if you do the same experiment and use uh, inhibitor, which will inhibit the phospholipase C, what can you notice? In about, let's 30 minutes, what is going to happen with those inositol phosphates? They do have a high uh, turnover rate and they will disappear. So this IP6, which is very abundant, it will take a little bit more or longer time. It will disappear in about 120 minutes. So, okay, that's fine. Uh, but if you ask yourself what is going to happen with the cell cycle then, uh, the cell cycle will change uh, very much. How? This is normal cell cycle in the yeast following the release from alpha factor. It will go through the cell cycle. If you block the phospholipase C, so the cells got stuck. So there will be some, let's say, they will start to progress to, through the cell cycle in about 120 minutes. If you have the phospholipase C mutant, which means it doesn't have the phospholipase C, it looks the same, which means if you don't have the phospholipase C, it will be rather difficult for cells to go through the cell cycle. Okay. The other thing what uh, we were interesting, okay, as we noticed that this pyrophosphates IP7 and IP6 increases during the cell cycle progression, let's see what is going on, how this is uh, happening. Uh, the precursor is IP6, once again it will drop down. If you measure the kinase activity, and this is the KCS, you have this top KCS uh, uh, yeast, so what is going to happen, you will have increase in the uh, KCS activity, which means you have the increase in the enzyme which actually phosphorylates these uh, compounds to the pyrophosphate, which means you need to have increase in the pyrophosphate concentration. So you can now uh, ask yourself, okay, what is going to happen, for example, in a mutant which doesn't have this enzyme here? So what is going to happen with the cell cycle? Very simply, you have delta KCS, which means, fine, uh, you won't notice any pyrophosphates, okay? Still, you will have increase in IP3. The level of IP6 will stay the same. So you omitted all the pyrophosphates. How this will affect the cell cycle? Uh, very simply, okay, if you have delta KCS1, the problem, huge problem with the cells, it will not go through the cell cycle. The cell cycle will be delayed. On the other hand, what you can do, you can say, okay, uh, besides, this is the phosphorylation pattern of the inositol phosphates to the pyrophosphates, you have the phosphatase. And if you do the deletion mutant, and how will this deletion mutant then respond? So if you look now what is going to happen with inositol phosphates in DDP, which means phosphatase deletion mutant, so what can you notice? You can notice that you will have increased in IP7 and IP8, which means that pyrophosphates will increase in, its, in their concentration. And if this is happening, how the cells will respond? Uh, the cells will respond uh, in a such a manner that they will progress a little bit quicker through the S phase of the cell cycle. Okay, so this was what can be concluded from, from those experiments. You need to have the KCS, you need to have to have the PLC, if you delete those enzymes, the cell will not progress to the cell cycle. If you increase the level of the <coughs> pyrophosphate, what will be the response? Okay, the response will be that the cell will progress a little bit more quicker to the cell cycle. The beauty of the yeast is that you can overexpress the enzyme very easily. So you can express either the PLC or the KCS. So what will be the consequence? Uh, if you overexpress the KCS, so what you can notice, those pyrophosphates will be increased. What will be the, uh, let's say, uh, consequence for the cell cycle? The cells will progress a little bit quicker through the S phase of the cell cycle. Okay? If you overexpress the phospholipase C, like here, so huge increase in this. Uh, I know that all phosphates, but if you compare this pyrophosphates with the control, they will stay the same. 
how the cell cycle will look if you compare this to this, it looks pretty much the same. So uh, phospholipase C is not the key enzyme which controls cell cycle progression. If you overexpress both of them, like here, so you will have huge increase in all these inositol phosphates and power of phosphate, what is going to happen, the cells will progress through the cell cycle much quickly. So uh, what we can conclude from those experiments very simply that uh, the cell cycle is controlled by the inositol pyrophosphates. And now this is the key question is how, okay? This is just a phenomenological uh, manner, so this is something which we did or I did most of those HPLC experiments in the last couple of years. The cell, the cell cycle is somehow controlled by the inositol pyrophosphates and now we come to the question how, okay? There are a couple of different issues uh, how this can be done. One which has been known is very old story that, for example, telomere length may be controlled by the inositol pyrophosphates. It's very well known. This has been published for a couple of years. Uh, this compound here can control telomere. So if you have uh, the maintenance of a telomere is rather complex story. It happens during the S phase. Uh, the telomerase, the enzyme which is uh, actually uh, elongating the telomeres, needs to have some proteins and one of the proteins is this TEL1. This TEL1 actually will uh, be capable of activating the telomerase and then by extending a telomerase. This compound here which is known to be 5PPIP4, so it will block this uh, protein here and that's why you will have short telomeres. So if you just measure the telomere length, so this is the wild type here and this is the uh, delta tel, so what is going to happen, those delta tel cells do have uh, short telomeres. Uh, usually if you look at the, let's say, uh, nature of metabolism in normal cells, the amount of this compound is very low, you so can't detect this. So you have to have the mutant cells, which is the IPK1, which will not produce IP6, but then KCS can act here and produce this PPIP4. Okay, fine. When you do this, what is going to happen? Uh, you will have the sh short telomeres. So in so-called delta IPK1 cells, once again, you have short telomeres. So then you, if you ask yourselves, has this anything to do with the cell cycle? Uh, you will be uh, quite astonishing what is going on here. So if you look 60 minutes, that is the time when you can notice any difference between the uh, different cell cycle. If you compare, for example, the control one, if you compare the four, which is the delta IPK and delta TEL, the cell cycle is the same, okay? Which means um, telomere length will not determine the cell cycle and vice versa. If you overexpress the KCS in IPK1, you will have huge increase in these inositol pyrophosphates. So what is going to happen with the cell cycle? The cells will progress. What is interesting here that this pyrophosphate is different to those pyrophosphates, okay? Uh, that, that the cell cycle control has nothing to do with telomere length. Simply, if you just omit the TEL1, this is the protein through which the, this PPIP4 actually works actually what is happening, the cells will go or progress very nicely through the cell cycle. So what can be concluded from uh, this experiment, very simply, that the pyrophosphates, which are actually somehow controlling the cell cycle, uh, does not, uh, can switch for one another. So this is different source, different kind of pyrophosphates, and this is a different kind. This has nothing to do with the telomere. Now the question is, how this can be done. So this is the last slide. Uh, there are actually two different papers which might be related. First one is very famous, both of them for, uh, is from Salomon Snyder, and the Salomon Snyder is one of the icons of inositol lipid signaling. So they, uh, let's say a couple of years ago, they actually, um, presented a paper that uh, there is a phosphorylation of the protein by inositol pyrophosphates. Um, it's not very well known how this is done. It looks like this is done directly. 
the proteins does not have to have uh, different protein kinases which will then be involved, but there will be, a, uh, let's say, a possibility that those proteins might be pre-phosphorylated by the different protein kinases. So it might be very interesting to do a very simple experiment in this system when you can manipulate with the levels of the inositol pyrophosphates, see how much phosphorylation you will get in the different proteins. So I just pull up one example, and one example in, is SICK. SICK is very well known that it will control G12S. This is actually inhibitor of the um, cycling dependent kinase. So to overcome this inhibition, this protein needs to be phosphorylated. So one of my wild hypotheses is that maybe the pyrophosphates might get, uh, or SICK might get phosphorylated by pyrophosphates and then it can control cell cycle progression, which means namely S phase. The second paper which I would refer is that, which was, uh, let's say, published a little bit later, but from the same group actually, Adolfo is actually was postdoc here at Snyder's group. Uh, and he published that uh, the pyrophosphate may have something to do with uh, metabolism, which means with uh, glycolysis. So IP7, one of those pyrophosphates, uh, usually in the cell you have this certain transcription factor which controls the expression of enzymes which are involved in glycolysis. IP7 will actually block this transcription and glycolysis will be shut down. If you look through the literature, you can find out that during the S phase what is happening with metabolism that you don't need glycolysis. You actually need gluconeogenesis. So if you add the substrates, so uh, the cells will not use uh, glucose, but you will, you, they will use a glutamine. So this is the wild idea what I would like to study, and I did some application initially for the, for the grant, to study how these inositol pyrophosphates are actually involved in the cell cycle regulation. So the field is rather new. Nobody is known. We published our paper just recently about this uh, story of uh, the inositol pyrophosphates as signaling, but we don't, have, uh, we don't know what is the end product and how the inositol pyrophosphates are actually doing this. So at this point, I would like to stop. I would like to thank in personal some of the guys who did some experiments in, in my lab just very quickly, who did what. So uh, I decided when I become rather old, I would say, if I notice, uh, that um, So this was done by Mirza Zizak, one of my PhD students. Uh, uh, those experiments about was done by Vladiana Crljen and Aleksandra Sinjic, and uh, those experiments were done by Doraj Višnić and um, Vesna Lukinović. And what was done here in the terms of years was done uh, almost entirely by myself. So. I did another my life spin, so I decided to go to bench, and in the last couple of years, so I decided to do my own research by my own hands, and Dora, my life companion, she's only doing the cell cycling. So this is how we are standing. So I hope I will have opportunity to come here and maybe work with you, and my interest in would be to, let's say, figure out how I know acetyl pyrophosphates may control the cell cycle by protein phosphorylation or change in metabolism. So I'm prepared to take some questions if you have. Thanks. <laughs>